All right, welcome back. So carrying on with this theme of, of the impact of subliminal seduction or, or subliminal advertising, now, now we're actually gonna have like a local angle because one of the key figures in the 1970s is actually a professor, or was a professor at Western. Uh, Wilson Brian Key uh, was a communications uh, sort of scholar who was in the journalism program at Western in the late 60s and early 70s. And he actually um, uh, became very fascinated with the issue of the power of advertising in society. And he was particularly, uh, particularly moved by this idea of subliminal messaging that we've been talking about. And so he had um, one of his classes, he, he would do things like this. He would... Uh, you know, on a nice day, he would take them outside. They would all lie in the grass. They'd look up at the clouds and he would sort of ask them to think about what images they could be seeing in the clouds, what kind of, uh, you know, whether a cloud configuration would look like a, a cow or, or a turnip or whatever the case may be. And he was trying to sort of train their minds to think that way in terms of seeing imaginative possibilities. And then he would bring them back into the classroom and he, he had this sort of large collection of magazines, consumer magazines, with lots and lots of ads in them. And he would have them go through the ads looking very, very closely to see if they could find imagery in those ads that seemed um, to be of a certain nature, often of sort of a sexual nature. So over time, he, he sort of collected these ads that he himself found that he thought had sexual imagery that was um, placed in the ads. Like, for example, in, in, in this picture of uh, ice cubes in a drink or something like that. And, uh, and he published a book based on this research called Subliminal Seduction. And it was mostly a, a critique, uh, really an attack on the, um, the advertising industry and he argued there was a kind of conspiracy amongst advertisers to, in effect, embed imagery and advertising with certain kinds of subliminal messages, images that were often of a sexualized nature that was meant to sort of um, engage people at, at that subconscious level. They would be drawn to the ad because of the sexual imagery, even if that could not be overtly recognized when you were looking at the ad. So it was a way to sort of get around the advertising regulators because the, the imagery was not explicit. And it also was a way, he argued, that advertisers would do this because it was uh, a form of engendering stronger connection to the ad through the subliminal sexual imagery that was there. So he, he posited that advertisers had sort of powerful hidden messages that were that were being used to sort of... Uh, 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 the things that we talked about before in terms of um, tapping into our subconscious and to sort of override our, our sense of individual will and control. Now, when this when this book came out, it had almost no credibility amongst communication or media scholars. They basically derided it as being based on flimsy or no evidence. It was just really the subjective musings of someone like like key in terms of what he thought he was seeing he didn't actually have any evidence from ad agencies or advertisers that in fact they were deliberately doing this sort of thing that he was basically just projecting some of that cultural um that popular cultural anxiety that we talked about before regarding re regarding subliminal messaging and that he was basically just sort of reading into these ads that that kind of pulp that kind of popular cultural anxiety nonetheless the book was hugely popular. Uh, you know, it sold very well, not just in Canada, it sold very well in the United States. And Key became this sort of um, kind of a minor celebrity in terms of um, the message that he was putting out with this book. He was giving lecture tours. He was interviewed by the media lots. And, and more and more, he was attracting this type of attention. Now, the people at Western both in the faculty, the journalism faculty, but also the university as a whole, were not so happy about this. I mean, on the one hand, they saw it as really bad scholarship. It wasn't academically rigorous. It didn't really reflect the kind of work that would have been done in other forms of media or cultural 
um, analysis, etc. But they also, I think there was a bit of a uh, squeamishness around the fact that he was publicizing sexualized content like this um, and doing it in a way that um, seemed to sort of... Uh, uh, sort of um, in a kind of titillating way, I guess you could say, in terms of focusing on the sexualized nature of things. Now, he was eventually um, uh, forced out of Western. It was uh, in the mid-1970s. He basically took a kind of buyout uh, because he was tired of fighting with the administration who didn't want him to do this kind of research. And he um, effectively takes this buyout and then basically becomes a full-time book author writing books of a similar nature. And um, so some of the examples of books that came out after, here's here's one there, uh, Media Sexploitation. And there was another one called the, the Clam Plate Orgy and Other Subliminals, the Media Used to Manipulate Your Behavior. Um, another one called The Age of Manipulation. And he would go on speaking tours, uh, talking about this, this stuff and all the rest. And so um, the, his works, the, the original uh, Subliminal Seduction book, which was hugely popular, and some of these subsequent books actually engendered a lot of um, interest on the part of people. Because it was popular amongst people, not amongst academics, but it was popular amongst ordinary people who may have had this kind of you know suspicion about advertising, suspicion about the power of media, and could sort of latch onto this idea. Oh yeah, there go those advertisers again. They're they're putting um, you know phallic imagery in ice cubes to try and um, get me to buy that 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 type of scotch or something like that. I think though, um, I, I'm not raising key to sort of dismiss him outright. Um, and and by the way, one of the things I found out um, later, many, uh, a friend of mine in in high school in London, Ontario. A really good friend of mine, actually. It turned out her stepfather was was uh, Wilson Brian Key, and I found that out many years after my high school days when I when I saw her again or something, and I was talking about the work I was doing. Um, anyway, it's a long story I sh when she described what what happened to him afterwards and stuff like that. But but essentially, um, the this phenomenon I think is interesting um, because. For many people, and I count myself amongst these people, so young people in the 70s and 80s, for me, uh, this this book, Subliminal Seduction, was one of the first uh, books that would be kind of a media critique book, or in this case, a critique of advertising. It's one of the first things I read. It was in the um, high school library. And I remember taking it out and and reading it and, and you know because there's a sexualized nature i suppose when you're 17 you know that's that's a good thing right in terms of engaging you as a reader um but it was also me, me sort of trying to grapple with this whole thing wow like look at these advertisers they're 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 putting all this sexual imagery sort of secretly into the ads and they're trying to exploit us and they're trying to manipulate us and that sort of thing and i i think um that that actually is, is in some respects a kind of good thing that I encountered that book when I was 17. Even though subsequently I came to, to learn that most of what was in it was, was not credible. But it was an example of me engaging with a, a book that was trying to sort of peel back the surface level of things, right? Like what really is going on with advertising? What's the behind the scenes story? Oh, in this case, it's about subliminal messaging. Well, what else might be going on with advertising? Uh, that that kind of thinking. So in, in some respects, um, people that would have engaged with this work at the time, they weren't like dupes or or people that just couldn't figure things out properly. In some ways, it might even become a kind of entry point into other types of of um, query or investigation of media or advertising, trying to sort of look behind the curtain, so to speak, and to get a sense of where the real power lay. In that in that sense, um, you know, one my my I have an eighteen year old son, and um, sometimes he gets really interested in a topic, and he'll do a deep dive, <laughs> often with YouTube uh, videos and that sort of thing, and he'll get really you know excited about it and animated, and he'll want to look at some kind of issue, and so, sometimes it kind of leads to the direction of people talking about the moon landing being faked and and that sort of thing. And he'll mention that to me and I'll say, you know, you know, I don't think you should really 
believe that because there's really no credible evidence supporting that sort of thing. It's it's on the same level as aliens being a common visiting presence on Earth in the last few decades or something. And but on the other hand, it's good that he wants to dig deep, right? And I think in some respects we should always welcome the opportunity for people to do those initial dig dig uh, deep digging on topics, even if sometimes it leads them in a direction that's a bit tr troubling or problematic. I think later when we, we come back to later in the lecture and I, I talk about how we can think about this topic in light of some of the conspiracy theories around COVID-19 and the U.S. election, I think we have to keep that in mind, right? There, there can be some good that can come out of people really trying to learn more behind the scenes about things. It just sometimes the sources and the evidence they use for that can be can be uh, really problematic. So what um, started to happen when Key uh, released his books in the 70s and there was the sort of an upswing and this sort of concern about subliminal advertising, um, the issue was discussed in the Canadian House of uh, Par the Parliament. It was discussed in the Canadian Senate. There were calls by politicians to to ban the practice. Uh, formally, one senator, uh, a guy named Charles Potter, um, said that um, subliminal advertising involved uh, an evil genius gets exclusive rights to the process and headlocks the nation. Um, that these subliminal advertiser types, they would control everybody's cerebellum or their brain and will all become robots. I'm against it. That's that's what he said. He, he, he had to say that he was against it for people to really know that. So uh, the CRTC, the Canadian Radio and Tele Telecommunications Commission, even had some hearings on this issue in 1975. And again, um, there, there's no documented solid evidence that this is really happening very much. Uh, and yet the concern is so powerful that government officials feel they need to respond this way. So just building on what we talked about before in terms of the kind of context for understanding why people would be so upset about this. Um, just a few points here that I've, I've, I think you could even have a list that's twice as long as this if you wanted, but so <clears throat> media power, right? I mean, this is a, a prevailing concern that people have that the media becomes all too powerful and it can have a uh, harmful or a, uh, negative impact on people's lives. So when you think of one of the earliest instances of this was um, H.G. Wells' famous um, War of the Worlds broadcast in 1938. Um, this was Orson Welles, um, actually, who did the broadcast of the H.G. Wells um, novel called War of the Worlds, which is a story about an alien invasion of the United States. So there was a radio play broadcast in 1938 about this. And as the play was being broadcast, people started to think this was actually a real news event and they became really scared and they started panicking and they started fleeing their homes and crowding and filling the highways and the roads with cars. They were driving into the hinterland or whatever. For the two hours or so that this play was on the air, there was kind of bedlam and panic. And it was um, uh, afterwards, academics looked at this and you guys probably actually talked about this in some of your other um, MIT classes, this example, the War of the Worlds broadcast. But academics looked at this afterwards and realized that um, maybe radio is a powerful, more powerful thing than we thought it was, right? When it was um, only, it was introduced only about uh, 10 or so years before this. Uh, this kind of concern with the power of media also gets taken up when, with television, right? When television comes on the scene in the early 1950s, uh, a lot of critics were looking at that and saying, wow, like this can be a very powerful medium. It's not just audio. It's not just vis uh, vi uh, video. It's the combination of the two. And it's available right in people's homes, right? Those those places where they feel safe and they feel relaxed. You're going to watch this television right inside your living room or something like that. Um, and, and there was a lot of um, writing that starts, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, concerned with how television viewing would affect children, how it might, um, they were not thought to have the kind of critical capacities to understand the difference between an ad and content. And so the concern with television advertising to children becomes becomes a big thing. Uh, 
a concern with um, broader concern with the power of advertising and, and the kind of commercial power of marketing in general in society it starts to get taken up more in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And, and subliminal advertising is seen as a kind of proxy for that power. And then a general concern just about the increasing invasion of people's privacy through different types of technology that would allow them to do that. So Vance Packard in, in his book, The Hidden Persuaders that I talked about before, was in part him talking about these new types of, of depth interviewing technologies that was being avail made available now. And, um, and, and this was somehow encroaching more and more into our private spaces, our, our personal selves, and that this was, was really problematic. And then the one point to think about <clears throat> is the idea of information overlord, uh, over, overload, I should say, not overlord. <laughs> um, the idea that as you get into the 1970s, um, so imagine some older people in the 1970s would not have really had a lot of, when they were young, they would not have had radio, they would not have had television, they would not have had cinema. They would have had magazines and newspapers in terms of mass media that they were exposed to. So in the course of about 30 years, you, you see like um, the, the advancement of, of commercial cinema. You see the advancement of commercial radio, the advancement of commercial television. And there's a, a sense that people are being overwhelmed by all this mass media that they're being exposed to uh, as you get into the 70s. And so information overload becomes a kind of concern. People talk about media clutter, uh, advertising clutter. Um, there's so many commercial messages and other types of media messages that come into your lives. And then you start to think, well, how do I make sense of it, right? Um, how do I track it? How do I know what to absorb as being important? How do I know what to reject? It can create anxiety, right? And the way that people might respond to that anxiety is to latch on to something that would seem an obvious problem, subliminal advertising. So the concerns that you would have in these things that I've just mentioned here, right? Information overload and privacy invasion and the other ones, you might have these concerns, right? But the way that you can kind of uh, make them tangible and to sort of focus, uh, provide a focus for those concerns um, can be and for, for you know having some criticism or real concerns about something like subliminal advertising, which everyone's talking about as being this nasty, underhanded thing that, that advertisers are, are doing. Okay, so even if there's no actual evidence of subliminal advertising, there is a lot of evidence for information overload and the increasing invasion of privacy and the, you know, more and more advertising you're exposed to. And, and you know, there's evidence for the power of television, right? So. You know, you can see that there, but the way that you can channel that concern may actually uh, end up focusing on something like like subliminal advertising. Now, the way that this topic is being played out more in the last couple decades, I would argue, and so say from the 90s, 80s, 90s up until the present, is more um, uh, it's more in the realm of uh, fictionalized accounts in cinema. And the rest, I think there's less anxiety about this today. I think other things have sort of replaced subliminal uh, messaging as a source of anxiety. Um, so these are examples of some movies that have um, basically to, to develop or advance the plot, there's some aspect of subliminal messaging that is, is it features in these movies, sort of like that movie Agency that I talked about before, right? So these are just a list of them. I'm not really going to go into, into detail them, but essentially... The idea that somehow you're being controlled by a power you don't understand that's sort of subliminally kind of connecting with you below your radar, below your level of consciousness. These become um, sort of narrative devices in, in programs like these. <clears throat> now, I want to just mention this one example. Uh, it's a really interesting one from, from 2000. And this was uh, an election ad by George Bush. He was... Uh, competing against Al Gore for the presidency in the 2000 U.S. election. <clears throat> and the, Bo the, the uh, Bush campaign released this ad. And you can um, look at the ad now. Just maybe I'll pause, uh, or you can pause me and then look at the ad. And um, 
it's sometimes called the rats ad. Uh, it's essentially an ad that basically it, it, it's just really about saying that um, the Republicans are going to do a better job with prescription drug prices. So no big deal. But what the um, ad actually does is when the word bureaucrats comes on um, and they're basically saying the Republicans or Bush is saying that it's going to be the bureaucrats who will set the prices and that's a bad thing. They actually um, have a subliminal flash, a very brief subliminal edit of the word rats, which, you know, when you see the word bureaucrats, rats is, are the last four letters. And they put it away to court to sort of make it seem like the Democrats are rats in this sense. And when this was pointed out at the time, it's, some of the responses are really interesting. Initially, uh, the Bush people just said, no, we didn't do that. Just sort of if it's there, it's sort of an accident or something like that. Um, and, and George Bush actually said uh, his response was conspiracy theories abound in American politics, but we don't need to be subliminal about prescription drugs. Now, soon after, though, the guy, the Republican um, advertiser who made the ad said that, well, the, that flash of rats um, was actually deliberately edited in. And he, he referred to it as a visual drumbeat to make you look at the word bureaucrats. Now, the ad was actually pulled soon after the controversy developed, uh, which, which again speaks to this concern that people might have about, uh, like the ad could have all kinds of inaccuracies and could lie like a lot of these political ads do. They have outright sort of factual um, lies in them, right? Uh, and that's okay. But when you actually have a subliminal kind of flash of something in there that most people wouldn't even notice, um, you pull the ad because you don't want to be associated with the, the nasty topic of subliminal messaging. So that was, uh, the, the ad was pulled. And some people were even getting the, the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC. Uh, they wanted them to investigate because they had a policy uh, that advised against sub any kind of subliminal messaging, even um, uh, was, they believed it was contrary to the public interest. Um, the Advertising Research Foundation basically issued a statement saying that advertisers do not, do, again, what we saw before, right? Advertisers do not do this. Uh, it's it's uh, fictional to think that they do. He said, uh, the fellow who wrote this said that um, subliminal advertising was in the same category as astrology and alien abduction, something that wasn't really factual or based in truth. Um <clears throat> Academics said at the time that there was no conclusive evidence that subliminal advertising works, etc. Now, interestingly, in 2008, a couple of psychologists thought, well, why don't we do a study? And just, we'll just actually take this ad and we'll see if the research subjects respond differently to a version of the ad that has that rat's message in it and uh, another version that doesn't have the rat's message. And what they uh, or had sort of different kind of neutral words that were presented as well. And what they found was that there was a slight negative impression of a candidate, a political candidate that was featured in a so-called rats ad versus candidates uh, who weren't. Now, again, the impact was tiny, was slight. It wasn't something that would really move you to want to do this as a as a kind of advertising strategy. And it didn't seem to have any kind of long term effect. Right. It was only noticeable in the immediate kind of subsequent um, uh, testing that would have been done with those those research subjects. Right. Didn't carry over to the next day or the day after, etc. Now, that's an example of um, what sometimes is called priming. And, and psychologists often do this in their studies. Right. They want to see if uh, if you prov uh, introduce a certain type of variable, you, you ask somebody a bunch of questions and then you introduce a variable and you see the next set of questions when they answer them, if their answers change based on what variable they they were um, introduced to. So some some psychologists started doing studies where they they um, they had research subjects do crossword puzzles and those would have um, like courteous words and polite and words and kindness kind of words. And, and then they had others that would do kind of more gen, uh, more word neutral crosswords. And they found that the ones who did those kind of polite crossword puzzles, actually, when they tested them later, tended to um, um, 
you know, give va greater value to politeness and courteousness and that sort of thing in terms of what they thought an ideal person should be. Uh, they did another one. I think this was interesting too. Um, with um, Apple, they did the same thing, you know, a flash of an Apple logo and, and then with one group and then the flash of an IBM logo with the other group, again, at, at a kind of bare subliminal level and found that those who were exposed to the Apple logo performed a little bit better on a creativity test. Now, again, marginal difference, not a great difference, and short-lived, right? So there may be some kind of minor um, change that can happen in someone's behavior, their outlook based on being exposed to this, but it's not significant, right? And again, it's not being done by advertisers. These were just some, some psychologists that thought it would be interesting to do these, these sorts of experiments in the last decade or so. So this is not something that... Um, you really would, I, there's really no compelling case for why advertisers would do this um, as any kind of strategy or any kind of way to, th to have proven effectiveness. Now, what you do see, though, in popular culture are forms of are references to subliminal messaging in the form of humor and parody. And you just want to look at these ads. The first one's actually just a year after this uh, subliminal messaging ideas introduced. And again, they're already starting to make fun of it, potentially. And then the one from Sprite is from, uh, you know, about 10, 15 years ago. And it's, uh, it's actually quite a good ad in some respects, but you can see it's, it's clearly tapping into people's awareness of this issue. Not that they're afraid of it, that they, they might think it's a kind of joke that some people might be afraid of, of subliminal messaging. And uh, of course, no, parody or humor reference would be complete without an example from Family Guy or The Simpsons. And you can click on those and you'll see how those shows have sort of made fun of people's concerns with um, subliminal messaging. Okay, so just to conclude then, we, we've looked at the historical uh, origins of subliminal messaging and kind of the tra trajectory of it over a number of years. I would say that today probably when people think about this topic, I think they're more likely to think of it in a kind of comic or humorous sense. I don't think they're as worried about it today as they would have been three or four decades ago. Uh, the topic is important, I think, even though, as I've said quite a lot today, that there's not empirical evidence supporting any kind of you know, systematic use of, of subliminal messaging by advertisers. I still think it's important to understand the phenomena, to understand the way it kind of is a form of folklore, right? That exists amongst people in terms of their understanding about advertising. And as I said before, um, it is a kind of early form of sort of contextual critique. Like I said, when I was 17, I, I got that book and I read it, um, Subliminal Seduction. And it was a kind of entry point for me into thinking about media in terms of the backstory, right? I mean, you think when you, when, you know, what you do in MIT, it's it's part of a lot of what you do is just learning the backstory of things, right? Um, you, you, you know, it's not just about the program content you see, it's trying to understand the political economy of television, right? Or the political economy of the producers of a show like that. Um, when you look at an image, you might look at semiotics to try and understand the way symbolism works in the, in the image to convey meaning and that sort of thing, right? So that's those are forms of uh, textual critique or critiques of industry. And again, it's it's about moving beyond the surface level understandings of things to, to understand that backstory, which can become really important. Now, I think for tomorrow, uh, what I'd like you to do in, in the tutorial is to think about what I've talked about in terms of two very pressing uh, and very topical issues today, right? And that is the, the way that misinformation and disinformation might be a factor in terms of ideas uh, of, of things around COVID-19 and, and the American election. So misinformation, disinformation, so based on what I've talked about today, the misinformation are people who come to believe that subliminal advertising is omnipresent, even though there's no evidence for it. The disinformation would be coming from people like, like Vicari, the guy who did that initial press conference, the market researcher, 
the first promoter of subliminal advertising as a kind of business model. Um, that's actually kind of a disinformation because it, it seems to be the case now is that, that that study either was not really done at all or the findings were not documented at all, right? So if, if it is the case that he basically is making up those results and then telling people that those results are true and then disseminating that information, that's disinformation because it's deliberately spreading false information. Misinformation is when false information may be spread, but people don't realize it's false. Okay, so think about those two concepts in light of what we talked about today uh, uh, with subliminal messaging and think about it in terms of COVID-19, the debates around mask use, um, the debates about the risk of getting it. I mean, the, the, people, the, the people that are um, protesting against mask wearing in public, for example, think of the, those issues and then think about the recently completed uh, American election and examples of misinformation and disinformation that are, are coming out of that, okay? Whether from Trump uh, or, or from other, other parties involved. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I just wanna say a few things about the test, which is for next week. Uh, so here's roughly the format. I've got about three slides on this, so just bear with me. So it's gonna be a two hour test. There's going to be two minute, uh, 10 minutes of grace period. So if, if, if you submit it, um, you know, two hours and 10 minutes after, it's, it's okay. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to join me in Zoom at 425 p.m. on the Tuesday. I just want to get a record of the people who are there. Um, and, um, and then at 430, uh, I'm going to, you'll, you'll get this, the test um, submitted to you uh, once you've all... Get, uh, confirm that you have it, then you just log off, right? You don't, you're off and then you're, um, I'm not going to be obviously watching you, you know, write this thing during Zoom. Uh, you log off and then you're going to submit the thing to OWL later in two hours. So the format is going to be this, <coughs> uh, two essay questions. Uh, you're going to get a choice for each one. Uh, choose one of two and then the next one choose one of two. These essay questions are designed so that they're not really going to be overlapping. You should be, they should be covering um, certain kind of content in one of those two sections. And then the other section will give you two choices that will deal with other kinds of content. Okay. Uh, there's going to be a short answer, which is identify and state the significance of. That's um, just five points. It's, it's a very quick thing. I want you to do it in point form, uh, no more than 10 points but just uh, identify, state the significance of. So if I said to you, I, I put down someone like James Vicari, which I would not do uh, for this test because I've just mentioned it, but also I wouldn't do it because it's a very obvious one and you're going to, you know, it's an open book test, so you're going to have this. But if it, like, hypothetically, let's say it was him, then you identify him by just saying, you know, he's this guy, he was a market researcher. Um, he had this kind of a market research operation doing A, B, and C, like I talked about in the class. The significance, though, goes beyond just him as a person, right? The significance is more in the realm of subliminal um, advertising, right? And, and some of the themes and concepts that we talked about. So you would want to just list those. Again, I'm, I'm not going to give that one. It's too broad for one for a short answer. Um, but just think of that. It's not just identify, right? It's, it's identify and state the significance of something. Uh, there's a max limit for the, answer, the essay answers. Each one cannot be more than 700 words, okay? Um, you're gonna format your, um, you're gonna use Word. You're gonna use times, uh, I should say New Roman. I, I, that's a bit of a typo. So I'll follow up with that. Times New Roman, the, the, one of the more common fonts, 12 point uh, one inch margins. And <clears throat> the um, essay questions will be worded so that it will be asking you to include content from lectures, readings, and where possible a video, right? And the video could be something like, like the Mad Men episode for today. Um, so um, not so concerned with grammar and writing quality for this. So I wouldn't belabor or worry too much about that, but make sure it's readable. Um, of course, it's open book because you're at home, you know, I can't obviously see what you're doing. It's open book, 
um, but there's no collaboration. So you, you cannot contact someone else and saying, oh, what did you put down for essay one or two? Um, I, you can't do that. Um, if, if I find out people are doing that, um, I will raise it as an issue of academic um, uh, integrity. And the other thing, too, is that when these exams get posted to the OWL site, they run through the Turnitin.com website before I get them, and they just flag any kind of common writing. Okay, so if, if people are actually sharing text, like sharing wording and stuff like that, it'll, um, it'll show up. The other way it'll show up is that I, when I'm reading these things, you get to some, sometimes you notice similar types of arguments that may be very unique, except just two people have them or something like that. So again, don't, don't collaborate and, um, and make sure that you maintain the integrity of this process. Now, preparing for a test like this, um, you study, you should be organizing your notes by themes that we've talked about in this course. And you should be organizing the lecture material notes, and you should be organizing your notes from the readings to correspond with those themes as well. So that when you get the question on Tuesday, you may well have a lot of it kind of blocked out already in point form because you've taken, you know, hopefully detailed notes um, from lectures and from readings. And then all you really have to do is kind of, you know, some cases it might even be kind of cutting and pasting, putting in some of your material from your notes already, and then just sort of framing it into a, a kind of an essay, a short essay answer. All right. So be sure for next Tuesday at 4.30 that you're in a good internet location, right? You want to be somewhere where you have reliable internet. So make sure that that's what, which, where you are. Make sure, obviously, that it's a quiet space uh, as much as you can. Try to make sure that for your own benefit, right, for writing. And then also be sure that when you're writing, just to keep saving your work as you go along, right? Because the last thing you want is for some power outage or something like that, uh, which can, may only last like five minutes or something, but then you may have lost um, work that you didn't save. So save uh, multiple times as you're writing. Um, if you get any if you have any questions about uh, the the test, um, I'm initially going to give it to you, and then uh, when you're in the Zoom call, if somebody has a question, I you know we can maybe do it on Zoom just before you sign off on Zoom. But if you have a question after you start the exam, you can call me at that. And it's my cell number, and I'll I'll just uh, I'll, I'll give you an answer. Um, at the end of the two hours, you're going to submit it to OWL, to the assignments page there, um, and submit it as I put here, right? It's a word attachment. Um, if there's a problem with OWL for some reason, then it's, you can submit it by email, but I don't envision there'll be a problem with OWL. Um, and submit it as a word attachment file, right? And you can see the way I've laid it out for you here. Last name, first initial, and then just 3325. Test. That actually is helpful when I, when I am in... Um, the OWL assignments thing and I'm pulling the documents out. If they're all alphabetized by the file name you give them, it actually makes it easier for me to um, provide comments and that sort of thing if I send you back a version of the exam. All right. Okay. So good luck with that. And we'll chat some more about that uh, tomorrow. All right. Take care.